in the Bible, Jesus said something in the 15th chapter of John that I think we need to look into because it's very important to us understanding the ability of God's Word to cleanse and to purge. In uh, John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, my Father is the husbandman. Now, one translation says it this way, I am the true vine, my Father is the farmer. Now, we can understand that, can't we? He's the one that causes it all to work. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more, more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now if you'll notice that Jesus has uh, uh, made a statement here that the word will clean you up. It'll clean up your act. It'll cause you to think right or th think the way that God thinks if we get our minds renewed to the Word of God. Now, down through the years, you know, someone has made the statement that uh, the Bible is so simple, you'd have to have someone to help you misunderstand it. And, and I certainly I believe that's true, because, but we've had a lot of help down through the years. And uh, if we don't understand the fact that the, the Word of God is not only the seed as spoken of in, in uh, Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. It says, the sower, Jesus telling the parable of the sower, and when he explained the parable, he says, the sower soweth the word. The seed is the word of God, but not only that, from what Jesus says here, the seed will also cleanse, and it is a type um, of cleansing, which is water. Then there, there's another area that we need to talk about. We'll, we'll actually talk about three, maybe four things here. The seed, the water, and the light. See, David said, the entrance of the word bringeth light. Now, any farmer knows that uh, if you don't have seed, saw, water, and light, you're not going to produce anything. I mean, you, you can plant a seed in the darkness, and it, it may sprout all right. It may come up, but it'll die. It just simply cannot survive unless there is soil, water, and light. Any seed must have that to grow. So uh, when Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the farmer, essentially is what he said there. My father is the farmer. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now go with me to Ephesians, where Paul refers to the word of God as water, or a type of water, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 25, as he has made a discourse here, in fact, let's start verse 24, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wife be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it may be holy and without blemish. So here he says, by the washing of water, by the word. So again here, he's, the scriptures refers to the word of God as being water, something that will cleanse. It will certainly uh, get, get some of the... Uh, <laughs> religious ideas that we've picked up down through the years. Um, sometimes I call it religious trash that we collect in our minds sometimes just because of a lack of understanding. Uh, you know, quite often you'll hear people talk about, well, you know, God did this or God did that. Now, under the Old Covenant, we find that many times things were attributed to God in the Old uh, Covenant that he did not do. But uh, Dr. Robert Young, who was uh, one of the 
foremost authorities on the Hebrew language, says in his book on hints to Bible interpretation that many things were attributed to God under the Old Covenant because of the, the uh, active verb that was used. It was uh, translated in a causative sense and says God did this when God didn't do it at all. Many of the things, many times it was angels that did it or, or just the law, the fixed laws of God that as we know today as he that soweth uh, shall reap, you know. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever he soweth, that shall he also reap. Now that's a fixed law of God, and uh, therefore things in that manner were attributed as God doing it. But we can understand today, because we have more light on the word of God, that uh, God didn't do everything that he was accused of doing under the old covenant, and not even some of the things that he was accused of doing under the new covenant. We find in the scriptures, uh, particularly uh, in the Old Covenant, but even also in the New Covenant. For one instance that I'm thinking about right now is where that uh, in Isaiah it says that God, it says it's something like this, don't remember exactly how it goes, that God cl would close their eyes, uh, that they would not see and believe and, and so on. But now when you read uh, the account of it in the New Testament, when Jesus brought that scripture back into perspective, then he says their eyes they have closed. In fact, I think it'd be good if we turn to that. Um, go with me there to, to Matthew, the 13th chapter. And uh, we begin with verse uh, 14. Jesus says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah's or Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. Now here again, if you read Isaiah's account of it, it sounds like God was going to make them to where they could not hear, and they could not understand, and they could not be converted. That's what the Old Testament, that's the way it bears it out. And, and I intended to get that scripture on... Uh, Look it up uh, and read it, and you'll find that But when Jesus comments on that scripture, he puts it in the right perspective. Now, he said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. But this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, then their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Well, now, if, if anyone knew what the Scripture meant, I believe Jesus did, don't you? So here you find that a Scripture under the Old Covenant that seemed to say that God did this to those people, Jesus brings it into the right perspective here in the New Testament and says, their eyes they have closed. And uh, when we realize that it's not a matter of God making these things to happen the way they did. In fact, if you're not careful, you'll even get the idea that, that Judas was predestined to betray Christ because of reading some things that it says even in the New Covenant. But you see, that is not so because uh, he was a man that had a free will and sin was in him. He was a thief. Therefore, he was used of the devil to betray Christ. But because of the way that you read it, some of the things that are said even in the New Covenant, it would indicate that, that he just couldn't help himself. He was predestined to do that. But that is not true. And um, when we get into the, the Scripture here in Isaiah, when we talk about this Scripture here, where Isaiah prophesied this, you see, you can have a Scripture, all right, that says seemingly says that, but you see, if you will put some water with it, It'll, it'll, it'll make it produce for you. And you see, the water is the word as well as the seed. It's also seed and water, and it'll cause it to produce for you. Now, here in the uh, uh, 15th verse, it says, Their eyes they have closed. Now, this word for closed is the uh, same Greek word that we get our word squinted from. Like if you walk out of this building, even though there's light here, and you walk out into the sunlight, you have to squint your eyes. You have to close them. So evidently, this is what Jesus is, is referring to, that when light had come, 
they closed their eyes to the light because they were so used to darkness. So that darkness caused them to become accustomed to the darkness, and then when great light came, they closed their eyes to it. And we must be careful that when uh, new understanding and new illumination from the Word of God comes, that we don't close our eyes to that illumination, as these people did. Because how many of you know that God is still giving more light on, on the Word today? And the, and the closer we get to the end of the time, then our light shall grow lighter, and I think we'll have great, greater understanding of the Word. Can you say amen? Now, let me remind you, we're talking about the Word of God as being the seed and the water, and also it brings light with it. And uh, we're talking about the fact that some things under the Old Covenant and even some in the New Testament are referred to when it's referred to in the Scripture that God did this certain thing. Now, another scripture I want to uh, mention is the fact that uh, when uh, the children of Israel were in the desert, and uh, the Bible says that God sent snakes among them and bit them and they died. But now, when you go back and study that in the context of it, God told them what was going to happen to them if they didn't obey his word. Now, when they didn't obey his word, their disobedience brought the serpents and brought the destruction and brought the death and the suffering. But it's translated that God did it. When God didn't do it at all, he just simply told them that's what was going to happen if they, if they got out from under the covenant. And they murmured and complained. In fact, in one place he said, it'll happen to you just like you say in my ear. And they said, we're all going to die in the wilderness. Now, you know, that's the Mark eleven twenty three of the Old Testament. They got exactly what they said. And it didn't come because God was mad at them or any such thing. It was because they had disobeyed God and, and he, his law was already in motion in what you sow, you reap. Now, let's go to a, a passage of Scripture in Isaiah, the 41st chapter, and verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them, and I, God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open waters in the high places. And fountains in the midst of the valley, I will make the wilderness a pool and the dry land springs of water. In other words, God is saying here that, you know, that he'll rain on your desert if you need water. Now, I, I wanted to read this and use it maybe a little bit out of context here for the fact that uh, God will furnish water for his seed. Now, Go with me over there to, while we're in Isaiah, let's go to the 44th chapter and read another passage of Scripture, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. Now, of course, here, um, the word seed here is actually used in the sense of people. And, of course, uh, in the way that we're talking about this this morning is when you have the Word of God, a promise in the Bible, it is a seed. When you find the promise of healing, when you find the promise of uh, uh, prosperity or financial blessing from the Word of God, as you give, it shall be given, Jesus said, that is a seed. And uh, to, to plant that seed, you must have soil to plant it in, and you must also have water for it. And we need to understand that if, if, if we have water and no, no seed, well, we're, we're still in trouble. But God furnishes seed for the sower, bread for your food, and he multiplies the seed sown. And here he says he'll furnish water for the seed. Now, he's talking about here in particular uh, water for seed uh, or your offspring. But let's use it in the sense of the seed of the word of God. Now, in Mark, the fourth chapter, we notice that uh, Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, and when he explained that parable, he said uh, that uh, when anyone heareth the word, then cometh Satan immediately to take away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, in that parable, Jesus establishes the fact that the heart is the soil of the ground. Now, remember, any farmer knows you have to have seed, 
You have to have soil, you have to have water, and you have to have light if you're going to have any production. You can have seed, and uh, if you don't plant it, it won't work. If you don't have soil to plant it in, you don't have anywhere to put your seed. So Jesus exposes the the uh, truth of the fact of the kingdom of God and how it works in Mark, the fourth chapter, and, and in some of the other uh, Gospels uh, record the same thing. The 13th chapter of Matthew records it. But it is fully established that the heart is the soil where you plant the seed of God's word. Now, he said, when anyone heareth the word, Satan cometh immediately. Mark says that. But now, if you go back and read Matthew's account of it, and this is why we should study uh, all of the other accounts of it in the Bible, because one of them will pick up something the others missed. And you find that Matthew makes this account of it. In fact, why don't you, you if you turn there to Matthew, the, the 13th chapter. And let's just pick up in verse 19 where Jesus said, well, let's start verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone, notice, when anyone, that didn't leave anyone out, did it? <laughs> that got us all. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, catches away that which was sown in his heart, and this is he which receives seed by the wayside. In other words, the one that receives seed by the wayside, it didn't produce anything. So then, you, if you read Mark's account of it, you have the seed, all right, but you don't have any water with it. Now, see, water helps you understand it. In other words, we're taking, you interpret the Bible with the Bible. In other words, you interpret Scripture with Scripture. So the water of the Word will cleanse our thinking. And if you see what Mark said and get confused over it, well, no need to me. Uh, you know, taking the Word of God because Satan can steal it just any time he wants to. But when you come over here, you see, this puts water to it. This will water your desert. He says, when anyone heareth the Word of the kingdom, notice he calls it the Word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not. Now, that's the reason that Satan steals it from you. It's because we don't have an uh, understanding of it. We don't have uh, enough understanding to operate it. In other words, to cause it to produce and the water of the Word will give us understanding of it. You see, you can have a scripture all right, but if you don't have a working knowledge of it, then it won't produce anything for you. Now, Jesus said in, in John the uh, Gospel, uh, what is it, 8, 31 and 32, he said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and, and then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But now notice, it was the knowledge of truth that set them free. It wasn't just truth. You see, the Word is truth, all right. If you have a Bible, you have the truth. But you see, if you don't have knowledge of that, then it won't set you free. See, truth alone will not set you free. You have to have knowledge of it. And that's why it's so important to understand what Jesus was saying when he said, now you're clean through the Word, and, and Paul said, by the washing of the water of the Word. We, we get some ideas in our head sometimes that uh, I call them Sunday school ideas, and I don't know that we were really taught it. We just somehow picked it up on the way, you know, that, well, you know, uh, God sometimes, he, he, he'll, he'll do you evil, or he'll do something bad to you, make you sick, give you cancer, just to you know, to cause you to slow down or something. And, uh, but when we again study the Word of God, it'll purge that from us because God is not the perpetrator of evil. And if we, if we know what the Word says but don't understand it from what uh, Jesus said, here Satan will steal it from you if you don't know how to operate it and how to use it. I mean, if you just say, well, the Bible says, given it shall be given unto me, and... Uh, Mark eleven twenty three says, Whosoever shall say, so I'm just going to start saying that I have abundance and no lack. But you see, the water that goes with that is that you give, and it shall be given unto you. You plant a seed, and you reap a harvest. And, and the water that goes with Mark eleven twenty three that give you understanding of it is that you, whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, but believe what he's saying will come to pass. Then he shall have, eventually he shall have what's every said. And I think one of the most classic examples of, of uh, having faith and doubting, you see, in one place Jesus said, if you have faith and doubt not. Well, now, how in the world could you have faith and also doubt? 
evidently you can, or Jesus wouldn't have said not to have it. But he said, if you have faith and doubt not, then he said, you shall say unto this uh, mountain, be removed, and it shall remove. Now, in Mark, the first chapter, you'll find that a leper came to Jesus and said, uh, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, here's a man that had great faith that Jesus could make him clean. But now, see, he, he, had, the, he had the seed, all right. He had, he had truth, all right, that Jesus could make him clean, but he didn't have any water to go with it. He didn't have any understanding. He didn't know if Jesus would or not. See, it's not enough to know that Jesus can or God can. We've got to know that he will, and he'll do it for us. So Jesus, moved with compassion, reached forth his hands and touched him. The Bible says he touched him. And um, when he did, no power flowed. Nothing happened to the man. He's just as crippled as he ever was. He's still a leper. And then Jesus said, I will be thou clean. And immediately, the leprosy departed from him, you see. And now, Mark's the only one that records this, you see. He says, as soon as he had spoken. Immediately, the leprosy departed from him. Now, you see, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and healing power, but when he laid hands on him, the man didn't get healed. You know why? Because he had faith, but he doubted. He believed God could, but he didn't know whether he would or not. So he had great faith that God could and that Jesus could, but he did not know, didn't have a working knowledge of the will of God concerning him. Therefore, he didn't receive. But as soon as he had the word, as soon as it rained on his desert, it produced for him. If you say amen. So you see, we must have the seed and the water. Now we're talking about the, the Word of God being the seed, the water, and also the means of bringing light. David said, the entrance of the Word bringeth light. Now, go with me over to Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Let's begin with verse 10. Well, let's back up. I don't believe we can start there. Let's, let's back up and start with verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if you're not careful, you see, here's, here's some of these religious ideas that I was talking about a while ago that we must take the Word, the water of the Word, and purge and cleanse ourselves of. I, you hear people all the time saying, well, you know, God says His ways are higher than our ways, and, and that uh, His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and higher than the heavens are above the earth. Well, He did say that, all right. You see, they had the seed, all right, but they didn't have the water that went with it. See, now here's the water that goes with it. Look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. He's talking to the wicked and the unrighteous man. He said, your ways are not my ways. To the wicked and unrighteous man, you need to forsake your ways and come on, to, uh, come on up to my ways. And then, you see, we can walk in God's ways. We are capable of operating on the same level of faith with God. We must be because Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believeth. So, so we can operate in God's ways. There's no doubt about it. But now there's, there's a prime example, you see, of, of somebody having a seed, but they didn't have the water. So what it did, instead of blessing them, it held them in bondage. Well, you know, God said that we can't attain to his way. No, he didn't say that at all, see. But you see, what was meant to be a blessing to you, if you don't have the water for it, it won't produce for you, and it essentially becomes a curse to you, to where you can't even operate in that, because you think it says something else. Then come down to verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Now, as the rain comes down, and snow from heaven, it returns not thither, but watereth the earth. You see, the seed, um, not long ago I saw a documentary on Ethiopia. And if you remember, for several years they've had a severe drought over there, and it just showed the barren land and trees that were dead, a few, what few little trees there were there were dead. There was just sand, as far as you could see, nothing live growing. And... Uh, 
But then later they, they showed when the rains come, in the rainy season, when the rains would come, within a few days it would just be green everywhere. Just the seed was already there, but it had no water. And it was just a barren desert. I mean, the folks just dying by the thousands because it wouldn't produce anything. But when it rained in the desert, it forced production in that soil. That soil had no choice. When the water got on it, it forced production. I don't know about you, but I've been talking myself happy about this. <laughs> it forces production. Now, what am I saying? Compare this to what Jesus said in Mark, the, the fourth chapter, the kingdom of God is if a man cast the seed into the ground. The seed is the word. The soil is the heart. And he said he cast the seed into the ground, and he should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. But you see, we know that that seed must be watered. So the person that does not understand that the word being the seed and planted in the heart is still must have some understanding of it to cause it to produce. Because there's a lot of people have the word of God in their heart, but they don't have any water to go with it. Take, for instance, I heard, heard a, a minister on, on radio just a few weeks ago. He, he was, and, and I'm not belittling the man because, you know, if you just don't know any better, you can't do any better. You can't teach any better if you don't have knowledge of it. But he was talking about the fact that uh, uh, somebody had asked him a question and uh, about uh, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9 where it says, You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And he said, oh, well, now, he said the lot of the charismatics, they try to use that scripture as a prosperity scripture for uh, uh, financial prosperity. But he said, you see, that was just talking about spiritual things. Jesus made us rich spiritually. Well, certainly, Jesus made us rich spiritually. There wouldn't anybody uh, contest that. But yet, in the context of that scripture, you see, in fact, in both the 8th and the ninth chapter, of Second Corinthians, it is not talking about spiritual things. It's talking about money, finances. That's what he's talking about. And uh, in fact, Paul, in one place there, I think it was in one of those chapters, he said, "Take up the offering before I come. Don't 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 do all together after I get there." But now here, here's the point I wanted you to see. See now here here's a man that has the word. All right, he has the seed. But you see, it's going to hold him in bondage, actually. In fact, he went on to say that it's not God's will that, that we be prosperous, you know. Uh, we just, you know, and Jesus said, blessed are the poor, you know. And, and you hear people say that. Now, uh, see, they have the word, all right. They have a seed. And, and the Bible says, Jesus said, the word of God is the seed. Well, they have a seed, all right. But you see, if they don't have the water to go with that, they may become a barren desert. They may starve. They may starve spiritually, financially, and, and physically, and every other way because the thing that was given them to be a blessing to them turns out to be a curse because it was not rightly divided. See, they didn't have an understanding of it. See, by the washing of the water of the Word, it'll cleanse you. And, and Jesus said, You're, He purgeth it. The water is what will clean you up. And, and you use the Bible to interpret, interpret the Bible. You use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Now, let's just look at that for a minute. You know the grace, uh, turn to it there, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be, didn't say you would be, said you might be, made rich. <laughs> now, he's not talking about everybody having a million dollars. What he's saying is, the word rich there means abundance. Now, Jesus suffered the curse of the law. See, Galatians 3.13 said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So then, the curse of the law, as in, uh, spoken of in Deuteronomy, was threefold. It was poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. Now, Jesus had to suffer it all. If he didn't suffer it, then we'd have to because he suffered the curse of the law, then we don't have to suffer. So what Paul was actually saying was that because Jesus suffered it for you, 
and he became poor so you could have abundance. And you wouldn't have to suffer that. Now you can, but you don't have to. This message is continued on side two.